India has actually emerged as, as, as a silver lining in, in many of these issues, whether it is uh, trying to bring down regulation or it is allowing startups to flourish and so on and so forth. How do you view India today in the context of the hypothesis that you've laid out? Yeah, so firstly, I was very vocal about this, which is that uh, no matter what my political views may be, uh, from an economic standpoint, I was all with the government for not having gone crazy on stimulus in 2020-21. There were a lot of people here who wanted this government as well, clamor to go out, stimulate, stimulate, you need to do more, and stuff for that, back, like a huge clamor. And I was like, no, that's just not the right thing to do. Uh, partly because we are not in terms of, you know, we're not America anyway with a reserve currency, and, and the few emerging markets which tried to do that ran into trouble. Uh, yeah, subsequently, you know, the, the Brazils and other countries, you know, which ran into trouble by doing too much mm -hmm. stimulus. So first, it was a sensible thing to do to not go and have crazy on, on like stimulus back then. Secondly, India's trajectory broadly, uh, from an economic freedom standpoint, has been positive. Now, my frustration has always been on how much more can happen, right? In terms of the fact is that it's still a country where privatization is absent. Mm. Whatever privatization we see in this country is by malign neglect, mm. which is that in every sector you sort of, you know, like the public sector is allowed to slowly diminish and lose value while the private sector, you know, and we've seen this historically yeah. from telecom to airlines and stuff like that, the private sector keeps gaining share. It's almost like a free cakewalk from them. Mm. In the hospital industry, something similar is happening now. That You know, you literally have. Uh, it, it happened earlier in banking to mm. some extent. So I think that that's the whole idea, that... That, that currently, for example, I wish there was more that we could do. Mm. But broadly, the trajectory we've been on the last 30 to 40 years yeah. has been positive. Yeah. And the results are there for us to see, which is that we are not sort of voting to go back to what the 1970s and 80s are. Mm. Yes, there is talk in India on how to better design the safety net. You know, like are the benefits really reaching the yeah. uh, end person? How much has digitization helped uh, and not helped do that? I think those are legitimate debates. But broadly, I would say that the economic trajectory, as far as India is concerned, is something that I feel good about. Now, there are, and, and my only frustration is how much more could yeah. be done? I, I'll get to the unfinished business in just a second. But one of the other aspects, uh, uh, you know, in the context of debt and deficits that we were speaking of, and that's, again, positive uh, for India, uh, because the government has been meaningfully trying to cut down on both the debt and deficit. And I think that this is something that you point out as well, that beyond the rhetoric of saying that, look, we're going to be going out there and spending more, doing much more on welfare, actually, that there has been expenditure compression uh, and, and the talk doesn't really match uh, the, the numbers, which is not a bad thing entirely because there has been much more restraint uh, on the part of the Indian government. Yes, uh, the, you know, like I'd say that, Broadly, that's fine. I think that uh, in terms of the fiscal side, the macroeconomic management side, uh, whether it's inflation, debt, or deficits, I think that, you know, I mean, in terms of that, the numbers look relatively good. The problems we have are much more on the micromanagement side. The macro, in terms of as far as India is concerned, uh, in terms of there's nothing that I can say, uh, you know, like in terms of it's done really well. Uh, the issues which we can speak about is that the micromanagement side, all the distortions which are being caused. And that is something which I have issues with. I've spoken about in the past. As I said, apart from the frustration of what more can be done, it's about the fact that why is private investment still not picking up yeah. much more? Why uh, do you think that's the case? Yeah, so, I, you know, like in terms of, I still feel it's very tough to do business on the ground mm. in terms of that. I still, and one thing which I've been very vocal about is in terms of the, you know, like the role of the, the, the fact that you have weaponized the investigative agencies. I've been very critical of that, that you may do that for political purposes, but there are serious business and economic consequences to that. On the ground, we know it, that the fear now, once again, of, of being raided, of having the, you know, like in terms of the power that the uh, mm -hmm. bureaucrats have got on that, that at the top level, they don't even know that in terms of how it's being misused at the ground level, mm. what exactly is going on out there. I think that, you know, and the license, uh, you know, that, and the fact that, you know, some of these agencies have been even more weaponized in terms of the powers they have, who they can call for questioning, how that can be done. You know, the, like all this may appear optically, it's being done for anti-corruption stuff, but there's real consequences on the ground. We go, we meet people, we talk to businesses privately, we do that. So I think that it's, it's stuff like that that I have much greater mm. problem with. The macro management, I think, has been like, you know, really good. The micromanagement in terms of, like, why is it so difficult? Why is manufacturing of the share of the economy still stagnating, you know, at 14, 15 percent? 
uh, of like GDP forever. In, yeah. like, I mean, like in terms of that, why is foreign investment still not flowing in more the way like it should be? Why is, you know, like in terms of domestic private investment not doing more? Uh, because it's still the government capex cycle, which has done a lot. I think that those are issues that I would like to see more to be done for. And as I said, that the great opportunity for us is that, uh, like in a way, is that China has clearly imploded, mm. right? I mean, it's an economy that I've been pretty bearish on, as you yes. know, for a while. And I think that the China story is done. Uh, now, the debate in China is only whether... When you say it's done, what do you mean exactly? Because there was a lot of talk around, uh, you know, no one's anywhere but China and so on and so forth. But that's not, it hasn't played out that way. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. what, what do you mean no, by no, but I think China story is done in a way, like in the fact that I feel that the debate in China now is that... Can the, you know, that in terms of can the economy still grow uh, or is the economy headed for some sort of a property financial sector bust? That's the range of the debate. I think that the days when China could grow at even four or five percent are behind us, right? Because I think it's because it's demographics, yeah. it's debt are just totally against it. No country in the world can generate a meaningful growth when your population is shrinking. For the first time, Chinese population is shrinking. How do you generate growth on the back of that, mm. in terms of that? And then the debt hangover that they have is incredible uh, in terms of, you know, like how much debt they pumped up yeah. in the last yeah. decade. And, and they've created so much overcapacity across industries using this debt that it's very hard for them to grow out of this. So that's the debate as far as China is concerned. Plus, you have the added thing that because of geopolitical yeah. reasons and other things, uh, that nobody wants to concentrate their bets on China. But remember, when China was booming and doing well, it was attracting FDI yeah. of 3 4% of GDP. Foreigners were lining up yeah. to get into China. I saw that in the 90s and the 2000s. Foreigners just wanted to get into China, and they felt very secure and stable, that once we get into China, we know exactly what it is. In India's case, that's just not happening. Mm. That why are foreign investors lining up? It's, you know, you can't... I mean, to attract foreign investment by talking to the top CEO of a top tech company and keeping him happy and doing that. That's just the way it works. It has to be much more organic in terms of it. In China, the provinces were really attracting investment, going out of the way to do that. So the issue is that we need to think about those issues, about how do we do that? Because, you know, we can be happy with the current growth rate, which is 6 to 7%. On a relative basis, it's fantastic. At a time when the rest of the global economy is growing at 2 or 3%, maybe, it appears really good. When no other really you know, serious emerging market is out there. So on a, on a relative basis, that's great. But remember, on this path, our per capita income is still less than $3,000. Yeah. On this path, we are going to be, you know, in terms of, uh, we we'll won't even become a serious middle-income nation in the next 20 years if we keep down this path, you know, and people love to use middle income definition, I'm saying relative to then, uh, in terms of how will we appear in the, because on per capita income rankings, yeah. you know, we have emerged now as the world's, uh, whatever, fourth largest economy or something, mm -hmm. but on per capita yeah. basis, we are still in the bottom third uh, there. So right. how do we get per capita income levels to move much faster? I think that's the urgency I would like to see in the debate. So I think that, uh, just to, you know, uh, summarize this, Macroeconomic management, great in terms of that, but in terms of micro, what more can we do and get more growth ambitious? I think that's what I'd like to see because during China's heydays, we saw that.